Welcome to this episode of On Finding Peace, brought to you by Life's Journey Life Coaching. Our host, Chris Shea, is a counselor, nationally recognized speaker, and author on topics of guiding us to finding peace in our daily lives. Learn more about Chris Shea by visiting his website, www.lifesjourneyblog.com. Welcome, everyone, to uh, another episode of On Finding Peace, and I'm very pleased to be joined today uh, by my guest, Maggie Steele. And Maggie works with teenagers, is a life coach for teens, and is an author and trainer and a whole ton of stuff that you are. So um, welcome and uh, look forward to a good discussion on how teenagers. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much for reaching out and, and wanting to connect in this way. It's, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. So thank uh, you. No, wonderful. When, when I saw that you were working with teenagers and uh, that's something that I'm here and there through high school work and I have a few teens in my private practice, but most of my work has been with adults. So it was very uh, interesting and fascinating for me to see that, you know, someone is dedicating mindfulness, life coaching to teenagers. So uh, you know, I think that's wonderful and you know, it'd be great to hear about. So if uh, you can maybe tell us a bit about yourself and what got you started on uh, teenage work, we'll uh, jump in from there. Perfect. Okay. So um, I guess, you know, I can start by saying that I myself struggled as an adolescent. Um, I struggled um, with suicide um, thoughts on a regular basis. I uh, had a really difficult period, um, probably from 15 to, I'd say, um, 21 was really when I started to um, go through the healing process um, and and find another way of being with myself, um, which was exactly what what was the healing, you know, mm -hmm. mindfulness is what supported me in that process. So that's how I, um, I, I come to this work from a place of, I've been there. Okay. I may not have the exact experience that you're having. And I know that there's another option. I know that there's another way of being with yourself, of being with your thoughts. And um, that saved me. And, 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 and I feel very strongly that it can save other people. Mm -hmm. You know, suicide rates are um, nationally um, the second uh, highest um, cause of death for youth ages 15 to 24. And, um, you know, this is something I, I, I take very seriously and I'm really passionate about this work. And um, I think that part of the reason that I'm so drawn to life coaching is because we're talking about the present. We're talking mm -hmm. about here we are now, what's happening here, yep. instead of going into what happened to you, you know, and there can be a real, um, it's, it's, it's important to not negate that process. You know, there's some real um, important work that goes on with looking at the past and how it shaped us. Um, but I get really excited about, okay, so where are you now? And what is it that you want to do? Where do you want to go? Um, because in that place, we can look at, okay, these are the thoughts that you're having in this moment. Um, and, 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 and what can it, what does it look like to recognize them as just thoughts mm -hmm. and see, okay, what, what is it you want in this moment? Instead of letting those thoughts govern you and say, yeah, I want it, but I can't have it. Yeah. It, this, it looks nice, but that's not possible. Right. Try, trying to so, bring that notion that, you know, what you don't think is possible is possible if we just reframe our thoughts or change our perception. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, appreciate your sharing and, you know, bringing your story with this, because, you know, I think that makes a, a big difference when people are struggling, you know, to know that somebody understands on, on that deeper level. Mm -hmm. How were you brought into the notion of mindfulness? You know, it, you know, again, doesn't seem like a normal course of what yeah. happens in the world. You know, people either, you know, 
put you on drugs, take you to psychiatrists, you know, things like that. But, you know, to have found mindfulness, uh, you know, and, and that shift for your yourself, that's, that's pretty awesome. Yeah. Thank you. No, I, so I, I would say that the first, my first introduction to mindfulness was actually through theater, through acting. Um, and I, I, because I was so uncomfortable in my own body and my own thoughts, um, it was such a relief to get into another character. Okay. And um, part of what um, I learned as an actor, and I started to learn it around like 18, 19 at the American Academy of Dramatic Arts, um, which was this idea that if you're in the moment with another actor, then it's going to be more realistic to the audience. You're gonna, you're not gonna miss anything that happens. So right. I remember um, this, this, this acting teacher, Jackie Bartone. It was my first um, scene with this guy named Josh, and I came into this, the 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 acting space, and um, the first line was, "How's your sandwich? How's the sandwich? How's the sandwich?" And um, <laughs> and um. Uh, she cut me off every single time. She was like, get out, you missed it. Get out, you missed it. You missed the moment. And I had no idea what she was talking about. Right. And I was like panicking. I'm like, what am I doing wrong? <laughs> and then um, I finally came in. I think it was like the 17th, 18th time. And um, I was like, how's the sandwich? And he answered. And I I felt like I was there with him. I, I got what he was saying and I came back. And I was like, oh, okay, so... I'm in the moment. I'm not in my head. Mm -hmm. I'm in the moment. I'm in, I'm with him. And um, that was probably the first time that I ever thought of what that meant to be in the moment. And after uh, probably a year or two later was when I decided to get support. Um, and I, I worked with a therapist who had a background in mindfulness-based mm -hmm. uh, stress reduction. And um, we did some mindfulness work and um, – that was really the beginning of my healing process. But mm -hmm. I always attribute acting because there was this piece of me that was like, wait, I can actually be in the moment with this other actor. Mm -hmm. And there's some real peace that comes with that. So, yeah. yeah. So it all started with a sandwich. <laughs> it all started <laughs> with a sandwich and Josh Crouch. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> You know, and being yelled at <laughs> by Jackie Parto. Uh, if she's listening, that I love her. Yeah, we'll that was... sure this gets sent over to her for credit. <laughs> but, uh, no, but but that's that's wonderful because it's that stick to itness. You know, it, it, it's that we're not just going to let something go, but we're, we're going to do this, and not just for that perfection, but this is what we need. You know, and, and mm -hmm. you were missing that key component and, and she kept you focused on that component, you know. Yes. And, and that that made the world a difference, I said, you know, so. It really did. I mean, I mean, I don't even know that she, I'm sure she doesn't. I never said this to her, uh, um, but just how profound that experience. I mean, how many years later, you know, am I mm -hmm. still kind of thinking about that moment? And it's just, um yeah, it's 18 years ago. So I, I, I it, a simple little experience like that yeah. was actually able to support me in getting the help I needed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, which who knew at the time, you know, I mean, that, that definitely wasn't her push and wasn't your no. thought. <laughs> um, no. And yet over time, now here you are helping others refocus, mm -hmm. you know, that similar way. So how would you define what mindfulness means to you? You know, on a, on a lot of my broadcasts, you know, I, I talk about mindfulness and that is the main pitch of what I do. But from your perspective, how does this look for you? For me, hmm, gosh, it is, um, I'd say, you know, peace in schools, I, I, I am a, mindfulness instructor with them. Mm -hmm. um, and we often say it's being here and now with kindness. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I, I, that resonates deeply with me. And um, I also, I, you know, it's, it's about bringing awareness to the present moment 
and um, with with self compassion, with mm -hmm. acceptance of whatever is there is okay, right. and um, without labeling it as good or bad or um, right or wrong. It just it is what it is, and can we simply just allow that to be? Mm. Um, so that I think is kind of where I come from with mm -hmm. the, the mindfulness practice. Right. And I like that kindness piece. That That's a different feature that when I've talked to other people or even in the readings that I've done, it, it, it's, I think, implied, but mm -hmm. never really heard that vocalized, you know, that this is, you know, staying in the moment with kindness. And Because uh, how often are we so hurtful and harmful to ourselves. It's like, you know, we, we don't even pay attention to the things that we're saying to ourselves. If we did, I think we'd be really surprised if we, if they were like, if we were able to take our thoughts out and look at them and see right. what we're actually saying to ourselves. It's, I think most of us would be like horrified um, that that's what's going on in the background every second, you mm -hmm. know, um, it, it's, it's disturbing. And so it's really important to, I think, um, and part of what I attribute my healing to is bringing that compassion and kindness mm -hmm. to those voices, those thoughts that you're having and, and, and just not, not taking them as full blown reality, you know, yeah. like that is just a thought I'm having that is not cement truth, mm -hmm. you know, I think that's. That's yeah. key. Oh, definitely. Because self-talk mm -hmm. gets us in the most trouble. And, you know, it's it's that self-talk where, where, like you say, if we really wrote all that down and, and to see what we accept as far as what we can say to ourselves, we would never say to another person. But it's okay to say that to ourselves. You know, and yeah, you know, and, and that's part of what got me into the mindfulness was, you know, my training in cognitive behavioral work, looking at those types of thought patterns and how do you shift the thought pattern, you know, because mm -hmm. that's really what is key to healing. But you have to be in that present moment. You know, we, we have to kind of sit still with ourselves and, you know, understand that. And I guess for me, you know, in, in what work I've done with teenagers how do you get them to sit still? You know, especially in today's day and age, you know, they are mm -hmm. so bombarded, just like all of us, but, you mm -hmm. know, they're more ingrained in that bombardment of the phones and the electronics and the notifications and the, you know, that one of the things that I do right now with teenagers is, you know, we go on retreats and we try to spend some quiet time and they to sit still for like a half hour of just kind of quiet. It, it can't happen. <laughs> we, we do our best. <laughs> How do you so, work with that with mindfulness? Yeah. Um, well, again, I think it's the the mindset and the approach of there's no right or wrong way to do this. So, mm. you know, it's it's I think as adults, oftentimes we feel like um, this is what needs to happen. It needs to look a certain way and mm. and and. And actually, you know, if we're if we're just flowing with whatever shows up and allowing it to be whatever it is, mm -hmm. same thing with our mind, our thoughts, mm -hmm. you know, it, it can it can really just allow the adolescent to it gives them this freedom, um, which at this particular developmental stage in their life um, is really important. Mm -hmm. It gives them this choice. Right. right. And. Um, instead of giving them the specific, okay, you have to do it like this. This is what sit and 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 another piece that I'll add is that little by little, you know, expecting a lot in the first go round, it it's just it's overwhelming. Right. Um, I mean, for me, when I first started um, practicing mindfulness, I mean, that was overwhelming to, to sit for twenty minutes. I mean, oh my gosh! So even mm -hmm. just three minutes. You know, what right. is it like to just be here with three minutes of silence, just noticing the breath, noticing um, when you're having a thought and coming back to the breath? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. You know, um, so I there's an organization called Inward Bound Mindfulness Education. Mm -hmm. It's a five-day mindfulness retreat for teens. And um, 
I've been doing that with the deans for the past uh, three years. And I mean, they sit for, gosh, I want to say, I want to say like two, probably almost, yeah, I think it's about seven or eight sessions of 20 minutes a day. Nice. Um, so that's a lot of <laughs> silence and there's silence in the dorms. So um, you can imagine that it's silence challenging. Me, no phones, no technology in that way of. Mm -hmm. So there's, so there's no phones at the retreat. So they give their phones in for the five day retreat. Um, it's kind of like, you know, just, this is an opportunity for you to just mm -hmm. be with you and with your, your peers. So um, yeah, we ask that they turn in their phones and, um, and in the dorms, it's like, it, you know, the idea is that if somebody wants to come in and just sleep or just be alone and write, that they're not going to be distracted by a lot of noise. Mm -hmm. um, and that sleeping is really, a, the dorm is really there to, to rest or to sleep, right. but not to like socialize. And you can socialize outside of the dorm. Right. But um, it can be challenging at first. But by the end of the retreat, everybody's like, I don't know if I want to go back to <laughs> the real world, you know, exactly. it's so, uh, I don't know if I want my phone. God, you know, it's, so I think to answer your question, it's just little by little introducing little things and not attaching mm -hmm. to any particular outcome that we want as adults, right. you know, um, which is hard. Mm -hmm. I mean, I notice myself as well. Like I'll be like, Oh, I kind of want them to experience this. It's like, well, you know, they'll, they'll get what they, mm -hmm. what they get out of what I have to offer. Right. Yeah. And, and, and I like that because the whole freedom and, and the choice, you know, let, let them, mm -hmm. you know, guide that in, in that sense. But that, that is amazing though, that, you know, they can find that sense of peace, you know, where they don't mm -hmm. want to leave. They don't want their phones. They don't want, you know, like what they felt was necessary for life. Uh, now they realize isn't necessary for life. Um, and, and the difference. It's an amazing, yeah, mm -hmm. it's an amazing experience to witness. And, um, yeah, if anyone's interested in looking up that organization, Inward Bound Mindfulness Education, um, I Be Me, and then, uh, the organization that I teach mindfulness at, um, a high school, Franklin High School here in Portland, Oregon, mm -hmm. Um, is part of Peace in Schools, which is the first um, organization to offer four credit mindfulness classes in the nation. So instead of physical education, for example, um, students can choose mindful studies. Nice. So it's, yeah, huh. it's, it's both of those are pretty incredible. I feel very, very grateful to be a part right. of both of those organizations. What does mindfulness studies cover? Mindful studies covers a lot. So it's a, a 30 week, it's a semester long program. Mm -hmm. So we get to work with students. Um, you know, we some three, three days a week or two days, two, two or three days a week. It depends. Um, but you know, it covers everything from, you know, learning how to focus, um, the attention mm -hmm. on the breath, um, the body, uh, sounds. Um, we talk about, the conditioned mind. Um, we talk about self-talk and um, yeah, just we cover so yes. many things. Loving kindness, um, understanding what it's like to cultivate self-compassion, mm -hmm. compassion for others. Um, yeah, we, nice. we cover quite a bit. Nice. And is this something that they can choose to do or is this part of their curriculum? Or? Yeah, so it's it's an elective and it's a four credit elective. Mm -hmm. So instead of, for example, physical education or another option, um, they they can choose mindful studies for a semester. Um, it's semester long, and um, we do mindful movement for okay. a portion of the class, mm -hmm. and then mindful studies, which is uh, yeah, mm -hmm. what I just shared. Yeah, no, that that's really mm -hmm. excellent, and it is. This information, on our website, you know, I'm thinking that others, you know, might be listening and say, hey, you know, can yeah. we bring it to our school system or our school, you know, like, what do we do? Because th this was, is sound yeah. awesome. <laughs> Absolutely. So peaceinschools.org. Um, 
is is where you would go. And um, I Be Me is um, national. So there are retreats on the East Coast and the West Coast um, and in some areas in the Midwest. Right. No, that ib.org or dot .info. I think it's ibme.info. We can try that. Um, cool. Yeah. No, that, that, you know, to get kid in there, because, you know, what I'm thinking with teenagers to help them through all of their life struggles, if they can learn mm -hmm. these techniques, how much better their early adulthood is going to be, you know, mm -hmm. that they can spread that to others. I'm sure it, you know, leads someone into their family life and just really change things. Um, how do you see teenagers, you know, taking this? I mean, do, do they seem receptive to something like a mindfulness mm -hmm. or is it totally bizarre to them or both? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it's both. I, 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 you know, it depends on the teen and, mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't want to speak for all, all, all teens everywhere that I've worked with, but, um, I, I will say that, um, there are so many that, um, basically say that it has changed their life that, and, I'm not saying that lightly. Like I'm, I'm being very honest with those words. Like um, we have a, a video of a student right now on the Peace and Schools website that shared her story. Mm -hmm. And um, she's, she really does say that it has changed her life. Um, I, I know what it did for me as a young adult. Um, and, you know, I, I think the reason I'm here is because of what I learned right. to do. Um, and how I learned to practice. So I, I really, I, I think what we're doing is a really big deal. And um, it, it, you know, I mentioned the suicide rates earlier. This is, this is an opportunity to support our youth, give them tools that they can use, um, no matter their socioeconomic status. This is not mm -hmm. about um, needing uh, to pay for any service. This is, you know, you have everything you need. Right. You just, all you have to do is, um, learn some tools on how, how to focus the attention and notice thoughts. And, um, I mean, the impact has been pretty huge. Mm -hmm. Are there st uh, statistics on this yet that show, you know, in, you know, proper behaviors versus suicide rates or, uh, uh, no, kids getting in trouble or things like that. And has any of that been studied yet? Or is it still, you know, the, the anecdotal that, you know, yeah, we know it, it works. We keep doing this. Well, we do know um, because of brain scans and research around uh, the, the, the change in the gray matter of the right. brain that mindfulness does and practicing meditation does impact um, us in a positive way. Mm -hmm. Um we we definitely know that in the developing brain of the adolescent, um, it does support emotional regulation, um, and because the prefrontal cortex hasn't been fully developed, that's a really important piece. Yep. Um, but um, as far as suicide ideation, because that's a really a key piece of my interest mm -hmm. with this, and I think it supported me um, in, in thinking differently around. Um, that I, I know there's been research around veterans okay. um, who and who practice mindfulness and had suicide ideation and that there was a shift there mm. uh, that took place. But in adolescents, I'm not aware of any research right. studies that have been uh, that have been have happened as of yet. There may be. Mm -hmm. um, I just I'm not aware of them. Yeah. And, and, you know, to me, whether the research is there or not, I, I'm all for this and, you know, wish this would spread all all around, you know, mindfulness yeah. does work, you know, and, and it is life changing and it's something that leads, you know, people to find, and, you know, for teenagers in this tumultuous times, that's what they're looking for is, you know, how can I find some, can I find something, you know, in, in my own life, uh, you know, I think yes. this gives them a way to do that. Yeah, absolutely. 
And another piece that I, I think is really important, you know, I work with teens individually with my life coaching practice, mm -hmm. and we incorporate mindfulness in those interactions. But I really do think that there's a lot of value that comes from um, group work and having other teens sh connect with on an in an authentic way. Mm -hmm. um, and that takes time, you know, building trust. And um, but I think that there is something really important that happens and unfolds in a group setting, because I know for me specifically, um, you know, I felt as the I, I was in isolation, I didn't, I, I didn't feel like any anyone else was going through what I was experiencing. And that was part of the reason that, that I felt like suicide was the only option. I felt like I was so not where I was supposed to be mentally and, and that something was really fundamentally wrong with me. And what we, what we see in the group setting is that suddenly it's like people are connecting and hearing one another and sharing their stories. And there's this understanding that, whoa, I'm not alone. Mm -hmm. I actually have people in my class that are maybe not struggling in the exact same way I'm struggling, but they're struggling yeah. and there's some, their pain there. And that, that connection is critical, yeah. I think, to healing. Oh, most definitely. I, I've worked for a few decades now with addictions and you see group work and, you know, the self-help groups. That's what makes it work, you know, is you don't have to have experienced exactly what, you know, each other has. But the fact that everyone in that group understands makes a world of difference. You know, I, I'm not alone. Others out there get it and we can join mm -hmm. in that. And teenagers generally tend to, like we like to say, you know, like run in packs, you know, they're, they're in groups, you know, That's so yeah, to bring them together. And the other thing that, you know, I found working with teenagers is a lot of times they hold all of this in, you know, and, and it's hard to realize what suffering they are going through. And with some of the teens, you know, that I, I would see on a daily basis and, you know, they seem like, you know, life is wonderful. And then they start telling you about their family life and their own struggles and what's going on. And you're like, whoa, you know, like, who would have ever thought you were going through all this yeah. because they're roaming around like life is great. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. And I think that that's really important that you even mention that is because, you know, I I remember 14, I, there were people that nicknamed me Sh Sunshine uh, in, in school, and mm -hmm. I was contemplating suicide at that time. Um, you know, it, there's no... Um, there's no way to really know what someone is going through just by how they behave. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's such an important piece to, to understand if we're going to support adolescents and, and prevent suicide. Like yeah. we can't just be looking for signs. Um, um, you know, there, there may not be the ideal, you know, red flags or, or things that we, mm -hmm. we, think makes them at risk you know it right. could be yeah yeah it could just be flying under yeah. the radar yeah you know and, and doing this by themselves you know which mm -hmm. you know when you look at things like this mindfulness and and you know just off the top of my head when i hear you know with, with this you know peace in schools initiative because you know that to me would be how do you get a teenager to come out of themselves to share, you know, what they're struggling with and what's going on instead of just roaming around like, you know, hey, life is wonderful and that's the persona I'm going to show you. Mm -hmm. They have a means, you know, by, well, I'm going to take this elective and, and mm -hmm. you know, this way I can maybe learn something and, and come out of myself. And, um, and it's an easy way because, you know, the other students could say something and say, yeah, I just didn't want to take gym, you know, so I'm just going to do this. Um, but besides that, how do you find teenagers to be able to, you know, how would you tell other adults, you know, how, how do you get teenagers to get the help that they need? Yeah. So do you mean, um, in my individual practice or, or in, in school 
What, what yeah, in, in general, I mean, generally speaking, and if it's, you know, examples with your own practice yeah. or within a school, because, you know, I'm thinking, you know, when you see these teenagers who are roaming around, who seem like everything is put together, you know, mm -hmm. and, and life is great, but there is that inner, what would we as the adults who's looking at this teenager who seems everything is great, how do we find out what's going on and, and get them into like a mindfulness and, and just something that would help them to not have to do this alone or not have to put on this happy face persona? Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful question. I, I think that um, one of the most important things that you can do as an adult is, and, and research supports this as well, is to engage, mm -hmm. engage and listen, um, ask questions, you know, um, without, you know, so for those of you listening that aren't trained as life coaches, mm -hmm. you may not um, have um, an understanding of reflective listening or um, what that what that entails. And oftentimes what happens is that um, adults, when they interact with teens, they're coming from a place of, I know best for you, mm -hmm. or um, I have something to offer you. I, I, and it's coming from a place of, deep care mm -hmm. and, and compassion. And um, what what that does is it shuts down the teen. It, 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 it makes it so that there's a right and a wrong. They're wrong, you're right. Mm -hmm. And you have the answers, they don't. And it just, it, it will put up a wall. If there was a wall already, it will make the wall even thicker. Right. If there wasn't a wall, there up goes the wall. So really what, what I would encourage you to do is to practice asking questions and reflecting back what you're hearing without giving your insight, without mm -hmm. giving your thoughts uh, to the teen. It gives them an opportunity to feel heard. Mm -hmm. It gives them an opportunity to be seen, to be understood. And that little by little mm -hmm. will allow them to open up to you. Um, if you come at it as I've got this great program for you, this is what you need. Again, you're coming at it in a way that says you're bad, you're wrong, you're right. broken, you need to be fixed. And that's not going to offer the teen an opportunity to feel comfortable enough or safe enough to share with you what they're having. In fact, it's feeding without you maybe even knowing it's mm -hmm. feeding this, this the negative self-talk that's saying something's wrong with me. True, because we're putting that out there, and and, and that's great advice, and and I, I can appreciate you sharing that because what we try to do is, is give out some practical tips, and you know a lot of people listening to this aren't the professionals, and you know might yeah. work with teens or have teens, and you know to know you know yeah just to be open to listen to ask for their advice and opinions, and, and I, I guess treat them like people. You know, that, that they're not, you know, five-year-olds that don't have a clue. I mean, they have a clue, you know. Oh, they have a <laughs> – yeah. I mean, all of my coaching clients, it's – that that's kind of the, the main thing that they underline at the end of our time together, that they felt like they really were able to get clear about who they are mm -hmm. just by me holding up the mirror, essentially. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people think that life coaches are there to advise and tell their clients what to do. And, and that's really a, um, a misconception. That's not what we do. You know, mm -hmm. we we trust that the client is naturally um, resilient, creative, whole, mm -hmm. resourceful, and that they have the answers. And I do that with my teens. You know, I, I, I trust that they know what their strengths right. are. All I'm doing is shining a light to help them get clear about what those strengths are how they can leverage them uh, so that they can move forward mm -hmm. and, and cultivate a, a life and connections with others that they feel good about. Yeah. Yeah, de definitely. And I've always looked at it where I'm the guide, you know, the, yes. I don't know mm -hmm. another person as well as the other person would know themselves. So Absolutely. I can be objective. I mean, that, that's a bonus, but yeah, all I can guide you, you know, and, what what I, I really like in the work that I've done with teenagers and, you know, is their insights that they, they do have insight into what's happening around them and their families and their friends. 
more so than I think we ever give them credit for understanding. Oh. You know, they may not always know what to do with it. You know, there, there might be some confusion next steps, but their insight into what's happening and what they would like to see, it's, it's tremendous what, what they have. And, and I wonder where we as adults lose some of that. <laughs> I think they have that better than we do at times. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and I mean, we could speculate that that's, you know, it's part of the conditioning, you know, mm -hmm. that we after experience after experience after experience teaches us, oh, well, you got to be careful or, oh, yep, yeah, that's a little bit too risky. Whereas adolescents are in this developmental stage where it's like, let me try that. Mm -hmm. What's that? Let me explore that. Yep. And um, yeah, I, I mean, there's so much going on right now around conversations, brain scientists and people that are interested in kind of restructuring our education system mm -hmm. to support and kind of nurture uh, the adolescent brain at this stage yeah. in development instead of it being what it's been for years, mm -hmm. which is, you know, algebra, science, history, you know, sure. instead of like creating a new way to support this like really vibrant and mm -hmm. incredible time that's happening neurologically yeah oh definitely you know this is where they're forming things you know and and like i say once once we you know show them and demonstrate over and over what they're not supposed to be forming then they'll stop forming it you know and, and mm -hmm. move on but it, it is great to see some of that thought process and you know a, a few times i've talked to different teens after they've done something and you know you can really look at it and say like well that was really dumb and not that i would say that to them but i'm thinking like that was really dumb why would you do that <laughs> but you know when when i would ask them you know like what were you thinking when you did whatever it was and a few times they'll look at me and go i wasn't i'm a teenager i'm supposed to do stuff like this <laughs> Mm -hmm. No, and, and that kind of hits me, you know, is there is kind of that understanding I'm supposed to, de you know, experiment, I'm supposed to try this stuff, you know, you know, like I'm a teenager, <laughs> you know, what did you expect me to do? <laughs> yeah, and I, I really think that oftentimes adults, because physically, adolescents can often resemble a young adult, mm -hmm. I think that that parents and adults often, um, the expectations are a lot higher than an adolescent is able to right. to meet because of the de developmental stage of their brain. Um, that we forget that mm -hmm. you know the part of their brain, the prefrontal cortex, that is able to rationalize and think things through and look look at the outcome and potential uh, possibilities of things happening in the future isn't fully developed. Mm -hmm. And um, I. I know for me, looking back, there are two specific situations as an adolescent that I am still just absolutely blown away that I didn't realize at the time that that was unethical or bad or that there would be a potentially bad outcome. Mm -hmm. I remember myself in both situations going for instant gratification. Literally, I I didn't... I. Just, I was just like, huh? Like, that's not a bad. And I know that my brain, like, it just wasn't, it, it wasn't making sense to me mm -hmm. that that was not a smart thing to do. Right. Yeah. And and brain science has taken us, you know, places in, in that sense of understanding it better, you know, and, and mm -hmm. I think it's important. And, and I really wish there was some way to get more parents to understand that, you know, until they're almost mid twenties, you don't have a fully formed prefrontal cortex, and you know they are going to do stupid things, or or you're going to get answers like I didn't think, you know, because they can't think it through. You know, hopefully we do, and and I think that that is that you know where you you look at them and say, but I would have thought that through. Why didn't you think that through? Well, your prefrontal is already formed. <laughs> Theirs isn't. <laughs> Yeah. You know, so I hope you would have thought that through as an adult, <laughs> you know, but, and that's not to, you know, let them get away with stuff. I mean, that, those are learning no. times, but, but you know, to really, you know, put that on them that you should have when they just, whether they would try or not, they can't, it's just not there. Mm -hmm.
So yeah, and I appreciate you mentioning. Yeah, it's it's not. Um, it doesn't mean that we can't have conversations around mm -hmm. looking at what happened and and seeing how you feel now and what could you have done differently. I mean, those are really really helpful yeah. conversations for adolescents because right. the, in retrospect they're able to see okay so that caused me a lot of pain mm -hmm. what what could I have done differently what strength could I have like you know for using the example like leveraged um, and how could that have helped me have a different outcome yeah. you know those are really powerful conversations to oh, have yeah. you know and and like what you were talking about earlier I think that's what helps the the team to have that trust with the adult. You know, if we can have that conversation versus saying, well, you should have, and then, you know, here's your punishment to really talk that through. Right. That should probably help, you know, so that if the teenager finds themselves in trouble or feeling suicidal or feeling, you know, hopeless or whatever it may be, you know, you would hope they could go to that person and say, here's what I'm feeling without, yeah. You know, knowing, you know, they're not going to be judged by that. They're not going to be, you know, told whatever. And, uh, but it'll be taken seriously and kindly and with compassion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I really do think that there's such a stigma um, around mental health issues and challenges um, in our society mm -hmm. that it it can be really scary to come forward and say that, especially if you know someone that's been um, hospitalized and they told you the story of what that was right. like for them. And, you know, there, it's, it comes with a lot. And um, I think it's really important that we start talking more openly mm -hmm. about mental illness and um, suicidal thoughts yeah. and, um, you know, things like well, that. I, I totally agree because it, it's really, for me, heartbreaking when I hear a teenager come and say, you know, I think my friend is suicidal, but I don't want them in trouble or I don't want to get in trouble. Mm -hmm. You know, that they're they're associating, you know, this condition with punishment, <sighs> you know, versus, yeah. you know, this is what somebody is going through. What can we do to help them? They're viewing it as punishment. And we, we need to get rid of that, that, that can't be viewed that way. No, no. And it, I mean, it's the same thing. I know you said you work with um, addictive um, behaviors and I, I, I feel like, you know, there, there is this kind of mindset um, that, you know, addiction is, is bad. Mm -hmm. It's almost like addiction and criminality are just yeah. like hand in exactly. hand. And it's like, it's so it's it's so frustrating to me mm -hmm. because I mean what we know about addiction is that it's often because of other underlying exactly. behaviors and challenges and experiences that that addiction is kind of like what happened because of it's the, the coping mechanism mm -hmm. that turned into potentially yeah. an illness. I don't know. That's not my area of expertise. I could be. Oh no, you're off, you're um, on and and and. Your premise, though, is 100 percent true in, in that, you know, you're you're dealing with, you know, addiction as mental illness. And and, you know, it's unfortunate that in, you know, this century, we can still look at an addiction as a moral failing and you know, mm -hmm. we can create the criminals out of addicts. You know, versus, you know, you, you wouldn't think any more of doing that with any other mental illness. You know, and, and we used to, you know, I mean, go back in the early histories of how you treated people with certain mental illnesses and uh, locked them up or put them away and didn't treat them well. And and yet we're still doing that with a segment of, of the population. Um, yeah. yeah, don't have an answer for that yet, but but you're right on with that. And and to see that attitude put over to teenagers when it comes to suicide is, is just not good because they're not going to come forward if they think they're going to get in trouble. If they're going to, they think they're going to yeah. get punished, they're not going to come forward. And if they don't come forward, well, you, you know, you gave the stats <laughs> and, and that's what happens when you don't yeah. come forward. So now yeah. you know, when you look at, you know, this piece in the schools and, and these retreats that you're doing and, you know, the, the outings, 
is there a component for the family? You know, I mean, where, where do we help the family to understand? Because, you know, the kids can go back after these five days, you know, like, hey, this is great. And here's what I learned. I feel so good about me. And you could run up into your parent that goes, yeah, well, that was a bunch of whatever. And you know, is there a family component to any of this stuff? Yeah, that's such an such an important point. Um, so at the end of the five day retreat at, with IBME, mm -hmm. um, one of the teachers um, meets with all the mm -hmm. parents if they if they right. want to come early on the day that they pick up. It's a choice, and um, if they want to sit and they basically give them a kind of debrief of what they've right. just gone through for five days and and what that might feel like and what that looks like and. Um, so that's a really beautiful nice. piece to, um, to the retreat. Uh, with peace in schools, you know, um, we're not there yet. And I think that that's definitely on our radar. Um, training for educators um, is something that we're doing um, for counselors, for those that support youth in those settings. Um, but for parents, we're not, we offer, sorry, we do offer... Um, uh workshops in oregon mm -hmm. for parents of teens i yes i'm sorry we're doing we're doing an upcoming one uh very soon i don't have the dates on me but yes so mm -hmm. we do do that okay. um so there are some parental mm -hmm. components i i i feel like that's a really really important piece and i mean when we talk about family systems, it's like you can't just focus in right. on one person and not look at, you know, the whole mm -hmm. dyna family dynamic. And I mean, for me with my coaching, you know, I always connect with the parent after a session, but via email, not giving specific details about right. what we focused on to confidentiality yeah. reasons, but I give them an idea of a suggestion of how they could support their team Perfect. that week. Um, and I think that that's another way that you can mm -hmm. kind of connect yeah. the pieces. Oh, definitely. You know, because, and, and I like that, you know, how can you support your team? You know, because that's really mm -hmm. the nexus of that question, you know, that, you know, you, you get these teenagers who are learning so much about themselves and, and that kindness to self and the compassion and, you know, everything that, that's positive mindfulness. And then if it, you know, they keep hitting the brick wall when they go home, you know, you, mm -hmm. you wonder how much keep that you know, going where if there was at least some understanding where even the parent doesn't have to buy into it necessarily, but at least enough understanding to listen to the, uh, you know, to their child so that, uh, you know, it, it can keep reinforcing, you know, and, and you know, the, the person can still do what they're doing. Um, so that that's excellent, you know, to have some sort of follow up. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And, and there may be situations and I have had many situations where um, the caretaker or the parent um, just isn't on board mm -hmm. with the work that the teen is doing. And um, in that case, it's just another learning opportunity for yeah. the teen of like, you know, what, how can you respond to this situation? You know, what tools do you have to ensure that you feel good, you feel right. safe and you can keep moving toward in the direction that you want to move in. And that happens a lot, you know, um, that comes up in our sessions and, mm -hmm. um, it's just another opportunity to go, okay, yeah. so this is what I'm faced with and what can I do instead of, you know, depending on the person in your life to be on board or, or support you in a way that you want to be supported mm -hmm. because realistically, um, we can't change other yeah. people. We can't make people yeah. the way that we want them to be. And, and it, it's unfortunate it would be from the parent, but it, it would be the lesson because in the future, you're not always going to run across people who are going to be supportive. You know, so you're preparing them for, for the future in an unfortunate circumstance, but still, um, yeah. you know, yeah. but yeah, a good life lesson with that. So... Yeah. For uh, I guess some parting words of wisdom. What what would you say to sum some of this stuff up as uh, as all that we've talked? Yeah. Um. You know, I I feel like to sum it all up, 
I think it's really important to hold space for one another's experience. Um, and, you know, to not put each other in boxes or label each other. And, you know, I think it's easy to do that when you are trying to help someone. Mm -hmm. And if that person is your child or your student and, you know, instead, I would invite people to hold space for that person's experience and to simply just reflect back what you're hearing. I think that alone can really offer more support than anything that you advise or, or tell them to do. Nice. Yeah. That, that's words of wisdom <laughs> for all of us. <laughs> not always easy, not always easy to do, uh, you know, but I do, I do think that there's a, a, a lot of, um, good that can yeah. come out of it. Uh, and I totally agree. You know, I mean, nobody said life was going to be easy, but you know, <laughs> especially in, in the dealings that I've had with teenagers, one of the things that I do love is even the ones who are, who are really suffering with whatever's going on in our family, they find happiness somewhere. They find hope somewhere. And, you know, in a lot of cases, they don't let that whole thing bring them down. And, and that's something that I have to remember, you know, is that, that there is good. Um, and we just have to keep looking for that. You know, we can find yes. it. <laughs> so... Mm -hmm. What's the best way for people to get in touch with you if they want to learn more about you and uh, what you do? How's the best way for them to do that? Yeah, um, I guess that you can email me. So it's Maggie, M-A-G-G-I-E, at thelifecoachforteens.com. Great. So, yeah. And you can check out my website, thelifecoachforteens.com. Um and yeah, I, I look forward to hearing from anyone and, mm -hmm. and supporting anyone that needs um, some help or support on the way. Perfect. So, and yeah. uh, you do your life coaching online, I see on the website. So people don't have to be in Portland, right? <laughs> yes, I, I yes, I do in person in Portland and via FaceTime, Skype and mm -hmm. all sorts of <laughs> tech techie ways all over the yeah. states so yes i can meet you online perfect perfect just opening up the base for you <laughs> so, yeah thank you excellent all, all right. right i really appreciate your time and the wisdom you share and you know hopefully this is something that can help change somebody's life and um and maybe we can get people in, in other uh areas around the country you know and, and really help more teenagers uh, i appreciate our, all your sharing and, and everything that you're doing. Thank you, Chris. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Take care. Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to this episode with Chris Shea. Learn more about Chris Shea by visiting his website, www.lifesjourneyblog.com.